what I do that's been translated as priest or priestess if it's a female. In Cherokee, it's pronounced Kulestulvi. And uh, that's something to do with owls. But it also has been translated <coughs> literally as Priests and the priests always have some kind of a headdress when they're doing a ceremony. It's evolved nowadays to uh, this or a cowboy hat or whatever. And uh, the women, who you never hear about, still to this day, some of them wear scarves, some of them have feather really cool. The ones that do like you do and you do actual healing are known as Gatnakti. Now, in the story of Selu and Kanati as it's written, it's actually pronounced Gatnakti. And the, the, the root to this word I think we're going to find interesting because for years, when I've told this story, I said we came here to fight the reptilians. I couldn't think of. <laughs> Masks. I'm going to leave that there so I can kind of like imprint it into my head. <laughs> the past me, uh, I remember. So, we got it in Ireland and Spain now. And, uh, you know, the Celts, this what these people are, have this like nature religion and all that. Way that the Christians try to put it down. However, the other thing they had fire. All their temples had fire going down. Okay, the next time that this thing appears in history, 
that we know of is with our boy Moses. Everybody's heard the story of Moses, and there's all sorts of controversy. There's no controversy in the fact he was raised in Pharaoh's house. And he would have been Pharaoh if he hadn't uh, got all freaked out for whatever reason and said, I'm out of here. And so he had one advantage over a whole bunch of other people he could read and write. So he's gone. He marries these two girls out here and he's going to her. He's got his thing going. And then he's talking to this burning bush that ain't being burned up and he's tripping. And we know that whole story and the exodus and all that. There's some interesting theories about that, that all those things that happened during the exodus also happened to be the time that Venus came zooming into the solar system because Venus that planet that we are all so familiar with does not appear in history anywhere prior to halfway through Egypt. Halfway through what? Egypt. The Egyptian really? civilization. About halfway through there, suddenly you find Venus on their star charts and stuff. And it's coming into the uh, solar system. Apparently, it was a really big event. All, all kinds of turmoil. And uh, there is Emmanuel Velikovsky wrote a thing, Worlds in Collision, and they said he was nuts with the latest astronomical studies seem to confirm that he was right. Venus is relatively new in the position it's in now, whether it was further out somewhere, there's no big deal or not, nobody knows. But where it is now is first recorded in Egypt, somewhere around the time of the story of Moses. And the ocean was America, America, the land under America, the land beneath the evening star. Isn't that cool? Anyway, got way off to Back to Moses. Moses does his thing, leads the Exodus, and they're following the pillar of Egyptian boys disappear out of the Bible. They disappear out of history. We're going to hear about them as far as the Bible is concerned. Jews do their thing, get all set up, got it going on, get their ass whipped a couple of times. And uh, second time, Babylonians are coming in, 
whip and ass, and, and the Jews have divided themselves, and the Hebrews have divided themselves. You got the house of Israel. House of Judah. Judah over here is sitting in Jerusalem. Israel's in the country north of there. Babylonians coming in with the ass. So Jews tell King of Babylon, we got a deal for you. Got an offer you can't refuse. You can have those guys. We'll give them to you. We'll deliver them up to you on a silver platter. Make slaves out of them, whatever you want. And so, King of Babylon says, deal. So, the house of Israel disappears in the battle. They're gone. They're just slaves, servants, whatever. These guys think we got it going on. And uh, King Babylon says, you know, you guys are so dirty and crooked, I can't trust you. So he kicks their ass and disperses them out. He don't even want them in his kingdom. So, they're gone. What do they call that? Displasia? Uh, uh, no, displasia is what dogs get. Anyway, remember what the Jews are always talking about. We have the great, yeah, whatever. So these guys, and you got to go outside of the Bible to get this one. And uh, <coughs> there was a contemporary historian of the time. And I think that was his name. Theodos of Sicily. The reason I know this when I was doing my master's uh, research, I can't remember why. Somehow I wrote to this library in Greece. I wanted a copy of this because it had something that I thought might be useful in my thesis. And so they sent me a copy, and it was like on scrolls, but you know, they unfolded it and photostatted it. And it's in Greek. <laughs> yeah, I don't read Greek. I looked at it and said, it looks Greek to me in the library and didn't even think it was funny. <laughs> she said, what were you expecting? <laughs> so I had around all over the campus and after a month of scrounging, my, my little friend who was with me all the time on this scrounging patrol says, well, you know, Ernie, I studied Greek, I read it. I'm like, what? You couldn't tell me this a month ago? And she's reading that. So, she did the translation. And it's interesting. These guys become like the administrators Babylonian government. Well, they take it over. They got it going on. They're the guys, they're the head of all the government departments and manage to bring Babylon down. This collapse. Okay, so now Babylon's disappeared out of history. Israel's disappeared out of history. This contemporary historian at the time notes that with the collapse of Babylon, on the 
southern shores of the Black Sea, a new people appear. A new people no one has ever seen before. <coughs> and they call themselves the Celtic, which in their language means by boat, big boats, well, probably I should say, one well, not Ireland and the British Isles. Apparently at that time it was all into the head of fire. Yeah. And to get them there, get them all settled in, feed them and say, so what's up? They tell their story and they're like, wow, okay. And their priests get with the Celtic, Druidic priests. They fast, pray, do all the science of the day. And uh, you get the message that's supposed to go on to America. And so they sail across the ocean. And they establish themselves in what <coughs> we believe to be people that have really studied this really hard. Northern Colombia. I think it was Colombia. Anyway, at the uh, headwaters That's where they end up. 
and uh, that was said to be just old Cherokee myth because there was never no civilization in this part of South America there. If there was, we would have found it by now, and there's nothing there but jungle and mountains. And uh, NASA satellites out there always doing things that screw up the uh, establishment story, finds all of these evidence of these cities underneath the jungle. Only people that have any oral history of that are the Iroquois and the Cherokee. And we happen to be the same folks. And so that's been proven. Somewhere during this time, something went terrible. Sacrifice became the uh, religion du jour, and the priesthood and the, uh, the uh, healers. Trying to understand each other. So 
So that was reestablished. And they agreed that what had happened was so horrible that they had totally pollute the land around them. They had put this evil intent and energy into the land that the land needed to recover and they needed to move. And so then we have the story and uh, I think it was in the 1970s, maybe the 80s, I believe it was the 70s. Someone wrote this down for us. It was a wonderful thing. They migrated. They migrated north. And you could, and I would have to dig through all my notes and all the footnotes in my notes to find the book that it's written in, but it's the uh, Cherokee, but it wasn't really Cherokee 
that is what's translated into now is on E.G. McGee. Mm. It has been that forever. And so, apparently there were more than seven plans when we were connected with the Iroquois, because the Iroquois don't have the same seven plans we do. And then we have our seven plans, and we get in that fight with the Delaware, where the Iroquois sided with the Delaware, and then, then uh, the Iroquois say the fight was drawn, we say we kicked ass in the battle for two uh, matter of perspective. Whatever was the battle, the two ended the war. Mm. Nobody won. We didn't win because we were already driven into the Smokies. The Iroquois didn't win because they didn't defeat us. And the Delaware didn't win because they didn't defeat us either, so it was a drop. We decided killing each other probably was the best way to handle the situation. <laughs> and then I think the last time we met, I gave you that whole political history between the red and the white fight. But this is the origin of the fire down to where we are now. This is our fire. Now, when the separation comes in, when, when we by ourselves without <coughs> Iroquois, we we divide the fight. We said, okay, there's a fight. Where even when I was doing my master's research, it got a little confusing to me. It, it took me years after I finished the manuscript to realize that these two existed in the same time and space. every town. Because the way you read the, the, the documentation, you, you naturally see this complete division. And I, did, I don't know if it's intentional, because the way it's translated or not, but I think it was just confusing <clears throat> to people from the structure, because you can't your mind doesn't put them both in the same place at the same time, functioning at the same time, doing two different things. It's, that's hard to process. But the white fire is in charge of the civil affairs. Day-to-day -day affairs of the town, and ceremonial. Red fire was uh, like the Department of State and the Department. Fence, if we were to try to make that core. This is what they dealt with, things outside of the town, outside of the uh, country, as it were. But at the same time, you have to keep in mind that each town was a like its own city-state. Yeah. They were only
this because they come together against the big enemy to defend this for everyone else. But the laws in that town might be completely different from the laws in the next town over. The only laws that covered this whole thing, and we'll get to those, are, are very, very, there's the, uh, the 12 laws that we have, we we'll call them the seven plans laws, and then beyond that are these things, these suggestions, not laws, suggestions about how to live a good life, suggestions on how to conduct warfare, suggestions on this, and they're all just that, suggestions. The only laws are those 12, but each town, the people could create their own laws. So like I said, you had like these little city states that uh, came together to resist a greater enemy, but otherwise they were doing their own thing. And uh, the division is artificial, but it's real. The town chief, the white chief, and the red chief were not the same person but they're having to consult with each other all the time. Uh, because members of the Gadugi were the exact same people that were the warriors. No, no difference, but the same people. The warriors in time of war, the rest of the time, they're the Gaduk, repairing the infrastructure of the town, maintaining and repairing the infrastructure. So it's kind of a hard process to wrap around in your mind, but this division real that they existed in the same time and space and functioned together until we come to the time after the American Revolution. And I think I've talked about that before when that whole thing fell apart and suddenly you got a war going between the white fire and the red fire, which should have never happened because it was all part of This fire that came from the way they used to it originally. And it's carried all this way. And, and this war that happened here should have never happened. But it did. And we come to this time. And this is the year 2015. And that war is still going on. It's time to bring it to an end. It's time to bring it to an end. It is on us to do that. It's on us to get our people and who is our people? Because I've, I've said this before and I piss off a lot of my relatives when I bring up this point. Cherokee has is not a here. If the story of coming from the Pleiades is true, then we got seven groups of people from seven solar systems. And uh, it's like Sam said, if you could get to the Pleiades right now and look, those seven stars are not this close together. No. You are talking tremendous differences. So 
those people probably were not the same race. And then you get here, and okay, they're stuck here on Earth, so they're going to mix in with the people that are here, the humans that are here. So anyone that was trying to claim a bloodline just lost it there, because now it's mixed. And when the story picks up back again in Egypt, you can't even find an Egyptian bloodline today, because it was a cosmopolitan center. And then you divide all that up and get among Celtic people, you can't find a bloodline there. Get down to the Iroquois, and finally down to us. Although most of my relatives have put this in the reverse order, doesn't really matter. There ain't no bloodline. It ain't there. The one thing that has been done. And I am taking people's word for this. I have never looked up the study. I've never read it. But I have been told by people that I trust you could do a
Are the, are the priests typically chosen by people, or is there a lineage? Right now, we have some people that are trying to claim it by lineage. And uh, after the revolution, lineage don't count. The, the one person who cannot be the priest after this priest dies is any relative. Of that okay. priest. Yeah. Or priestess. No relative can, no matter what the people say, that's just, no, we're not going to do that ever again. Nothing to go back to no longer ever going to be hereditary. Now, there's been instances where the son or the daughter of a particular priest or priestess was taught, knew it all, and couldn't inherit that, but that was okay anyway. Because generally that person was young, whoever inherited the position after this person passed on, generally was older. So later on the kid probably made it in there anyway. Because the priesthood is essentially meant to start learning when you're young, but the leaders of it, the high priest, priestess, and all that, are the elders because they've been doing it. Now they're typically seven white priests and seven red priests. Uh -huh. Is that the case today, or is it? Right now, I think there's one, two, three. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Five. Five. five red priests that I know of, and they may have. Anointed some more, but I don't. So know seven why. is now. Yeah, but but they would be doing their own thing because it's it's like okay those seven the seven red and the seven white are what translates into English as the uh, high priest. Priestesses. Oh, I said just because they didn't want it long. Okay, it's designed that, okay, this priest or priestess, whichever you want to call it, is supposed to be training some of Okay, and his or her successor generally comes, comes from, from that. That, that, those seven. And each one of them are <coughs> trading seven. Mm -hmm. And when they pass on, their successor comes from one of these. So if, if, uh, if this one is a male, these are female, and that's these male. are male, and just went on and on. on, and, on. Okay. and so it's specifically designed, I don't know if it was initially, but it is now that inheritance ain't possible. Mm -hmm. Just ain't possible because that's how the system got corrupt. And that's the same for the, the white yeah. fire as well. Okay. You can imagine there were some people really bummed out when number one up here on the red fire turned out to be me. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, what? <laughs> How did this happen? So now, with as be, you said that you're number one, does that mean that you appoint the net, the other priest of the other red fire priests? Not so much appoint them as uh, confirm them. Okay. Okay, like what Tupper called me is a. Uh, this is what's happening with me, and, and this is what I want to do. Can I do it? And I said, well, you don't ask me. You just do it. And he 
did, and uh, he invited us to come and see what, what he had got going on, and, and he had something good going on. Mm -hmm. I just confirmed that he did, you know. And uh, my, my, my relative, Jeff Horncastle, was somewhere up in British Columbia. I haven't heard from him in ages. Last time I heard from him, he was presenting some stuff. And then Jeff, you would look at him, and, and the, you want you want to point at someone and say, "There's no way you are in it." It was Jeff. What was Jeff about six two? Anyway, he's about this tall and white as you can get white, with freckles and this red hair that was just like wine. <laughs> wow. And uh, Horn Tassel is great great grandfather, maybe great grandfather, but not too far back, was like one of the principal chiefs before the removal. He was like the main man at the time and uh, fell in love with this Irish woman. What can you say? There went the blood. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I know, but you know how it is with your relatives. You are acquired by law and pomp and honor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you ain't no end, did you? Yes, I am. No, you ain't. <laughs> My cousin Charles England, who doesn't do too much as far as an organized thing like I'm doing. But, uh, one on one, Charles is like, he's dying and he's an artist. And uh, last time I heard from him, he was on his way to Colorado. And he's doing this thing. Then we got that one outfit in Missouri, and I've only ever met those guys once, and they're the ones that uh, threw my master's thesis on the internet. Which it was, but you know, I was just like, yeah, well, we couldn't find you. Don't give me that shit, I ain't hard to find. <laughs> now, is there any time that the the red priests and the white priests get together and it should have a council? Every seven years. It should occur every seven years. Yeah, seven to fourteen years. And you said should, so does it? <laughs> no, not really. Not we invited really. him. I think if we lived maybe a hundred years ago, it might be accurate. But one of the rules of the priesthood is that the people cannot pay. The people cannot pay. You have to provide your own sustenance so that uh, you're not a burden. Right. Yeah, so, so most of everyone's got a job. You say it's a non-paying job, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so to get together, you know, it was like one of those things like, oh shit, has it been seven years already? Uh, hey guys, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, it's been seven years. Fuck, I've used all my vacation time. Oh yeah, so that's yeah. the end of that. <laughs> It's not like there's not the desire to do it, but there's not been the uh, life and truth. But it's yeah, life and truth. But but still, it's something that it should be you know, it important would be, enough that it, it would it would be nice. But that's if it Skype was, these days, people can <laughs> yeah. do it. They don't even have to leave their house. See, that's that's the other thing. Do we want to do a video conference? No. So then you do nothing. Okay, it's just like, all right, we really got to do this, and maybe we won't. Maybe it'll be the ones after us. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Maybe it'll be the one after that. Yeah. Because uh, if things keep going the way it looks like they're going, it's as if it's not going to be allowed to travel around the country pretty soon. Yeah. But that won't last long. You know, just the, just the uh, flailing grass from a drowning system. Yes. And in the interim, we got to just kind of like we've already the observers. Won. We just have to do the deeds. That's the lesson for me. Yay! Please, please.